Please allow me to begin by invite you, inviting you all to join me in a prayer to Our Lady for her blessing, for she is our strength and our hope. Name of the Father and Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nubia in ora pro Amen. Saint Robert Bellarmine. Pray for us. Name of Father and Son, and Spirit. <coughs> Many thanks to the members of the American Tradition, Family and Property Movement who invited me to join them for the March for Life here in Washington, D.C. It was my first time in the U.S. It was great. And to give a speech here in McLean. Your work and the TFP is of greatest importance and your support means very much to me. And I can say with confidence that you are indeed fighting the good fight. Thank you so much for all this. I'm also very grateful to His Excellency Duke Paul von Oldenburg in particular, who heads the Pro Europa Christiana Foundation and to whom I owe my presence here with you tonight. Belgium is about the size of Maryland, about 12,000 square miles, but its population is twice the size of the population of Maryland, where is about 11 million people, roughly the equivalent of the population of Ohio. And we used to be a Catholic country. But our fate has been quite similar to the fate of Canada, whom you know used to be a Catholic country true and true, up to just a few decades ago when everything started to crumble. And now it's all about Justin Trudeau, his overtly gay liberal agenda and the unrestricted promotion of the culture of death. Belgium is, alas, a lot like Canada in this regard. But it didn't used to be this way. No, it didn't used to be this way. In the 16th and 17th century, the University of Louvain was a stronghold of the faith, and both monastic orders and religious families thrived. We had a plentiful clergy and sent missionaries all over the world, very much willing to be captured and tortured to death as they tried to bring back the erring sheep to the flock. Up to the mid-20th century, Belgium remained a vastly Catholic country, especially in the north. An important city, like Ghent, was deemed to be 99% Catholic in the 19th century. Even though liberal, communists and Freemasons grew in number and power with decades passing by, the country strongly held to the faith until the fateful 1960s. Then everything changed quickly in just a few years' time. And it's no surprise that it all began in the 60s, actually, since the so-called springtime. Now, if this is spring, then it fits the poet's description of a silent spring. The poet here is John Keats, who really nailed it in his famous ballad La Belle Dame Sans Merci. I quote, The sedge has withered from the lake and no birds sing. Just to illustrate with a telling figure, there were about 10,000 priests in Belgium on the eve of the council. We have less than 3,000 today, and in the, in the Dutch-speaking part of the country, the most populated and once the most Catholic part of the whole Belgium, recent statistics show that less than 250 priests will be active by the year 2030. With less than 10 new priests ordained in total, Each year, for the eight Belgian dioceses, there is no turning the tide in sight. As you know, yet the Son of Man, when he comes, shall he find, think you, face on earth. It's quite unlikely that he'll find much remaining in Belgium. Yet the crumbling did not just happen by chance. We first had Archbishop Sunens who wrecked a lot of things as early as the 60s. Then came Archbishop Daniels who headed the Belgian church for 30 years and who is notorious worldwide for his maneuvers within what he himself labeled as the Mafia, the infamous group of St. Gallen, of which I will say nothing here. 
He is also very well known for having covered up for homosexuality and child abuse within the clergy. After the grim Daniel's years, we had some respite, thanks to Archbishop Léonard, formerly Bishop of Namur, who was the only outspoken bishop in Belgium, the only one who went against the tide. He received no support from the other bishops, and he was constantly under attack and pressure from the media and the leftists. Well, not only the leftists, actually. Our leftists in Belgium aren't the only opponents of everything that is morally conservative. For the Belgian right is made of self-styled liberals and largely under the control of Freemasonry. Archbishop Leonard was prosecuted several times for being homophobic, you guessed it, and other like accusations that amount to nothing but noise coming from the very powerful and active lobbies. He was also physically assaulted a few years ago by the Revolutionary, Revolutionary Task Force, now as the FEMEN. I don't know if they are active in, here in the United States, but they are very much active in Europe. It's all financed by the Soros Group, so you know where they are. And to thank him for his courageous stand against everything unholy, Archbishop Leonard was removed from his position as soon as he reached 75, almost three years ago now, because his bitter enemies, amongst whom was Cardinal Daniels, at the Pope's here. The present-day Archbishop is more like a straw man. He's a nice fellow, to be sure, and a good listener, a kind man of amiable manners, but nothing like a leader or a shepherd markedly caring for his flock, and that at a time when the said flock faces strong opposition from all sides. Allow me to tell you just a few words about my experience in a Catholic university. I used to be an invited lecturer at the Catholic University of Louvain. I had been a student there in the Department of Philosophy, then an assistant, and after completing my PhD, I stayed there as a research fellow, for the, and then I became an invited lecturer until last year. I gave lectures in philosophy to students from various backgrounds, including applied sciences and economy. The lectures were aimed at presenting various philosophical issues and topics as an introduction to the field and its general interest for deepening our understanding of man and meaning. I chose to illustrate the interest of philosophy applied to a present-day concern by lecturing my students again Ab uh, about abortion. As I told them, a message is all too usually conveyed that abortion is acceptable. But this is all about slogans and catchphrases, really. And as young citizens, the students should learn to avoid thinking through catchphrases. A good judge, says Cicero, a good judge is one who hears both parties before making up his mind and taking a decision knowingly. Alas, alas, most people only hear one-sided views, telling them that it's okay to have an abortion. Well, I told my students that I wanted them to hear what the other side had to say and to reflect on arguments. I laid my cards on the table and made no mystery that I myself was very much against abortion in all cases. But I insisted nonetheless, it was a philosophy class, I insisted nonetheless, my goal was not that they would parrot me and feel complied to agree with me just because I was the man in charge. I said, my goal is that everyone thinks seriously by himself on the basis of arguments because I believe in the power of truth. They are free to disagree, but it is compulsory that they ponder the whole issue without just discarding it. My 600 students were somewhat surprised, as it was a bit of an unexpected topic. But the vast majority understood the challenge pretty well. Then I kept lecturing on various issues over the next few weeks without an incident. And all of a sudden, after more than one month, some small size LGBTQI, 
you know, all the alphabet quite a lot of times. <laughs> they alerted the media. The media went crazy, as expected. More unexpected was the equally crazy reaction from the authorities of my Catholic university, who immediately summoned me, while a spokesperson went to the media, and she addressed the media to assure that my arguments against abortion in no way reflected the official stand of the university. That lady heard about my calling a cat a cat, gender studies a delusion, and abortion a murder. And as the official responsible for implementing gender policy, for we have that in a Catholic university, as a responsible for implementing gender policy within the academy, she felt entitled to grant a TV interview and say that the Catholic University of Louvain rejected my pro-life views and that the very same Catholic university promoted a purported constitutional right to abortion and the right for women to choose and terminate their pregnancy if they wanted so. Well, this is both idiotic and malevolent. Remember, it's a Catholic university to begin with. And then you have that woman speaking on behalf of the university and standing for a so-called right to abortion that she says is enshrined in the Belgian constitution, which is a lie, by the way. Um. Our law, which is bad, but our law tolerates an awful lot. But there is no formal right to abortion. And that's the problem with, su with such people. They cannot help uttering lies. There is a Spartan saying that Hal Hoge Moros who can deny to Sigan, a fool really cannot keep silent. <laughs> and we know, for it's written in the Holy Scripture, that the number of fool is infinite. <laughs> and the university chose to endorse the views of that lady rather than mine and to suspend me immediately from all teaching activity. First, they wanted to have me sacked and dismissed, but a lawyer came to my rescue, scrutinized the university's internal rules, and discovered that sacking me was illegal. <laughs> they nonetheless kept me off the tracks while they devised something else. Appeal was made to an external commission which ruled that I had been, I quote the words, the very words which are edifying to say the least, the commission said I had been exploiting my teaching position on behalf of radical activism at the expense of, I quote again, a mostly deprived audience. If the whole thing didn't revolve around grave matters, it would be laughable. Take a closer look at things. Exploiting my teaching position? Well, in a philosophy class. I presented philosophical arguments showing that taking the life of an innocent unborn child amounts to murder. Radical activism. I explicitly told my students that as a lecturer in philosophy, I didn't expect them to agree with me, but to reflect on what I had said, ponder arguments, and think by themselves. As for the mostly deprived audience, I am quite sure the students are flattered at the Commission's patronizing tone and its objection to my treating them as intelligent adults. <laughs> Long story short, the authorities refrained from illegally sacking me out of fear that I would bring the case to the court. They maintained the ban on all my teaching activities until my contract was due to renewal a few months later. And guess what? I was not renewed. And it's not, it's not likely that I will be renewed in a foreseeable future, as you can guess. I got support from a few brave colleagues. Brave indeed, but few. In my own department of philosophy, only one emeritus professor took a stand for me. The others carefully looked elsewhere, ran with the pack, or came out in favor of abortion. 
but they were not suspended. Several colleagues also pointed out that we were to avoid sensitive issues that may damage the corporate image of the department. They told me plainly that they were worried about bad image that would scare students away. How is that not pushing the limits of decency? I raise the issue of children being slaughtered in their mother's womb with philosophical arguments that are in line with my position as a professional philosopher and lecturer, and they come up with obscene whining about the number of students who will enroll in the department. On second thought, they should get the numbers straight and consider how many people will never attend the philosophy class in their department because they have not been allowed to be born in the first place. <laughs> the, the bishop's reaction was appalling. I mean the incumbent bishops. For one Belgian bishop supported me, and you guessed it, it was Archbishop Leonard. But since he's now retired and living in France, he couldn't do much apart from expressing support, which he did. As for the others, the incumbent bishops, one of them said I got what I deserved. Since he believed I had infuriated the students, apparently unaware of the fact that I had kept teaching for several weeks without any incident until the media coverage triggered the whole show. Then there is one other bishop who said that, well, yeah, you know, abortion is not right. It's something that the church doesn't allow for, but you know, you have to be compassionate and you have to show mercy and acknowledge that suffering, that people are suffering and you should not condemn, etc., etc. But I did not condemn anyone since I just limited myself as a philosopher to define what abortion is all about, period. Now, the Archbishop is ipso facto nothing less than the great Chancellor of the Catholic University of Louvain. His reaction to the whole story was, I quote, C'est triste. This is sad. This is sad. This is sad. It's triste. And that's it? Well, yes, pretty much. This is hardly surprising. Our bishops won't take part or even back the March for Life in Belgium, officially because they are not the ones initiating the event. But I will let you guess what they organize. The bishops never raise a strong voice against the murder of tens of thousands in Belgium each year because they don't want to be perceived as haters. And because their main concern is to respect the other's viewpoint in a pluralistic society while paying suppressed lip service to the stronger demands of the faith. The same goes for a strongly related issue, marriage. I was, having, I was having a public debate a few weeks ago with another of our bishops, and the theme was the church and the Pope Francis. Well, as a signatory of the filial correction this summer, which, by the way, also caused me to lose my other job at the Jesuit faculty of Brussels, <laughs> for, as you know, mercy is heavy-handed nowadays. <laughs> I raised... The question about marriage, the question is crystal clear. Yes or no, is it permissible for di divorced people to receive the Holy Eucharist and keep sleeping with a new partner? Our good bishop refused to offer a straightforward answer. And the most I could get from him was, I quote, who am I to judge? No. <laughs> who am I? It's not over. He had a few more words to say. Who am I to judge? Who am I to refuse giving the Eucharist to one who wants to receive it? And he added, last but not least, that he would not himself provide any authorization for them to receive the Eucharist, but that he would, not get, he would get along with the decision of the people, since I quote again, the host is not only for the perfect, 
but also for the sinner, even though he may be in state of grave sin, if such a thing exists. This is pure sophistry. And as a philosopher, I feel offended by sophistry. So what then? Maybe this. I don't grant an authorization to rape women, but if you come to the conclusion that you may, then who am I to judge and stand against you? Who are you indeed? If not a follower of the apostles. And then came the inevitable mantra about accompaniment and discerning the will of the Lord. But there is nothing to discern here. Blasphemy is wrong. And so is rape. Period. And one should stand firm against it. People sexually active outside of wedlock are in an objective state of mortal sin that prevents them from being granted access to communion unless they repent. There's nothing more to discern here unless you are committed to spreading the disease. Hence the saying by a character from an ancient French tragedy. Allow me to quote in French. Mais je sais encore mieux qu'une aveugle clémence, loin d'arrêter le crime, en nourrit la licence. Even better do I know that blind clemency will not staunch evil, it shall instead give it free reign. While they are obsessed with not hurting anyone's sensitivity, they hurt the feelings of Catholics who try and live according to the unchanging teaching of the Church. They blur everything with their endless nuances. I'm just quite happy. I'm quite happy and relieved that several bishops have felt necessary to set the record straight and join Bishop Courageous and Brave Bishop Athanasius Schneider in reminding everyone the meaning and implications of marriage. And good news came also from Mexico and it has close ties to what I'm gonna say afterwards. It was Lord Cardinal Juan Sandoval Iniguez Emeritus Archbishop of uh, Guadalajara. He reminded everyone that sodomites, adulterers, and contracepting couples were not allowed to receive communion. If only more bishops spoke in such a straightforward way. But again, we were warned by the Apostle himself, for there shall be a time when they will not endure sound doctrines. Just a few days ago, when I was about to leave Belgium to come here in Washington, I was advised not to be too harsh in my criticism against the bishops of the Catholic University of Louvain. And really, I'm not here for the university bashing or the settling of personal scores with the ex-colleagues and the bishops. But how are we to cure the disease if we fail to speak openly and be vocal about what is going on. Please understand that it is not about me. Well, I'm a nobody, but my case is the one I know best and I think it illustrates all the point very clearly and shows us what we are facing nowadays. Then again, go, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that the bishops or those in charge and the colleagues I'm not saying they are bad people, much to the contrary. I, I, relieve, I really believe some of them, at least, to be nice fellows and kind and well-meaning. But let's face it, they are dramatically in want of guts. <laughs> and the agents of revolution know that, and they take advantage of that. That's why it is absolutely critical to be firm and explicit to revive the smoldering fire and to try and awaken what's left in people today so that we all man up before it is too late. The people who promote everything that is evil and contrary to the will of God are very strong-willed. They are efficient and they are not inclined to fair play. That's why it's not enough that we have nice people on the right side. Nice people who don't feel like biting back and lower their voice simply because they're not good at confrontations. They embolden the enemies of our Lord and His Church. When the foe understands that his abuses will not be checked, he becomes fearless. Simply put, this is all about bullying. The bully will keep going unless 
he is faced with a strong opposition. Well, I love that movies from the 80s. You know it, Back to the Future. And many of you well know the, the movie and there is this insufferable bully, the name's Biff, who keeps persecuting George McFly until McFly mends up and strikes back. So much for offering the other cheek then? Oh. Not at all. There is a huge misunder misunderstanding going on here because it's not about becoming a doormat. The apostle told us that the days are evil. Surely the days are still evil nowadays and even more so since we are butchering unborn children by millions. Something that no army ever kept doing with such hellish efficiency as Planned Parenthood, Mary Stopes International and the other merchants of death supported by governments with the taxpayer's money. Offering the other cheek is about growing in holiness for the love of Jesus Christ in the midst of personal humiliations. Now, opposing wrongdoers for the sake of common good and for the honor of God is a whole different story. Yeah. It's not about us. It is not about us as individuals, but about the welfare of the society as a whole, the survival of civilization, and the honor of our Lord more than anything in the world. Tolerating wrongs that insult God, ruin the commonwealth, and murder the weak has nothing to do with meekness. It's really all about being unwilling to exit one, one's comfort zone under the false pretense of not interfering with the so-called freedom of other people. The heavily sexual, sexualized revolution that went to war with everything sacred and worthwhile really achieved a masterstroke by granting us great comfort and prosperity that makes us dull and unwilling, unwilling to forfeit our tranquility and fight for the common good. What are we to do then? The apostle once again has the answer. He says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. We don't have to be nice to the ideas of the world. We should be nice to people, and more than nice. We should love them with all our heart in God and because of God. But we should never associate with the wrongdoers in their wicked schemes. So much for the preserving of diversity in a pluralistic society. Pluralism made equivalent to moral relativism and pervasive permissiveness is worth only contempt. It bears no value of its own that would deserve any kind of respect. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Even the pagan philosophers knew that. I quotations, I will not bother with, with quotations, but Seneca says it, Pliny the Younger says it, the philosopher Euphrates, then you have also, of course, St. Augustine. A lot of people said it already quite a lot of times. We can hate the sin and yet love the sinner. And let's, please, let's call things by their name. Rape is rape. Murder is murder. And never can it be labeled as health care. Not only according to St. Paul do we have to avoid bonding with the enemy, but we should fight back. Remember St. Ignatius, with the battlefield and the two standards, that's it. If we refrain from standing firm against the moral collapse, we have our share in the overall responsibility. Resistance is required, no, better, it is compulsory. I mean, active resistance. Seneca, again, had it right in one of his plays. He who does not prevent a crime when he can, encourages it. Basically, it is all about a very well-known and very true idea that the only thing necessary 
for evil to gain the upper hand and prosper is that the good men stay inactive and do nothing. There is more. Some may think that you earn the respect of others provided that you keep being nice to everybody and this is deeply mistaken. <coughs> he who thinks that being all sugar is rewarded with respect will soon discover that he has brought nothing but contempt upon his head. The foe will not respect you when you're gentle towards him. Much to the contrary, he will be inclined to think, and rightly, that you are way weak and that you may be trampled upon just like the doormat you are. And the TFP, I saw it, just issued a pamphlet for the March for Life. And we attended yesterday. And in that pamphlet, I read that, I quote, the temptation to water down our message is based on the false assumption that doing so will attract more followers to our cause. However, no one respects those who have no character and betray their principles to gain popularity. What then? If you man up and show that you are very much willing to stand for what you believe, and I see that in America that's what you do, you stand up for your beliefs, then you will earn the opponent's respect because only a brave and gallant fool is worth a true fight. When you stand against the revolutionary tide, you will probably be in want of, let's say, suppressive fire coming from allied lines. Many really don't want to get involved, so things might turn on to be rather harsh. The promoters of the sexual revolution and the genocidal agenda of the culture of death won't believe their eyes and ears that for once someone is being outspoken in his opposition to the revolutionary agenda. Then you shall hear loud complaints and cries of outrage being set off, which in itself is most interesting. Take a minute to let that sink in. Who cries and complains when he faces opposition? Does that really suit a grown man or lady? It's more like a lunatic's attitude or the attitude of a spoiled brat, a decent adult who meets with opposition, appeals to reason and builds his answer upon the solid ground of sound thinking and arguments. A madman or an uncouth and ill-bred child will put on a show, throw a tantrum, he'll rant and rave. Now, look at what's going on when you oppose the sexual revolution or the murder or of unborn children. Granted, there, there are some people out there who will argue against your views, but most of your opponents cannot seem to be bothered with arguing since they opt for yelling and screaming instead. Not only does this prove that they are lacking in manners, and actually, you know the saying, manners makes men, as they say, but, well, you know, all the revolutionaries are not as manly as expected from a man, if you see what I mean. <laughs> they are lacking in manners, but they also show how weak they really are. If they had arguments that allowed for a strong case in favor of their agenda, they would certainly try to overwhelm us with good re reasons to agree with them, but they don't because they have no good reasons. They cannot stand in front of us. The ranting and the raving is proof that they really have no arguments to counter the truth we stand for. And this comes as a very strong encouragement to us. We don't have to be afraid by all the sound and fury coming from the revolutionaries, because this is all about covering up for a tremendous lack of reasonable arguments. The opponents complain loudly because they lack a valid point and they are terrified to be forced to admit that all their revolutionary mantras are inconsistent and unsubstantial. Well, this is about 
abortion, but the same story goes for other revolutionary purposes. The promoters of the culture of death and sexual revolution are utterly unwilling to look at facts. I heard just a few days ago, I was on YouTube, and I saw a video by Ben Shapiro, who says that his opponents, well, they are not offended by his arguments, they're offended by facts. <laughs> <laughs> he really nails it. The promoters of the culture of death do not want to look at facts. Just give it a try. Show them how sexual revolution is about depriving children of their innocence, among other things. Show them how May 68 and its aftermath is about the dream of a Hamburg psychoanalyst and phony scientist, Wilhelm Reich, with his depriving children of their inner sense of shame and engaging in pedophile activity to force the revolutionary pattern in their mind. Tell them, and they will deny the whole thing, lock, stock, and barrel. And yet, there is ample proof that pedophiles thrive while the sexual revolution keeps moving forward. Maybe you've read the book of Gabrielle Kubi about the sexual revolution. She has facts. She shows it. She shows everything. And this is most important because people and we do have to be thankful for this. People usually retain a sense of shame and decency that keeps them from embracing the last consequences of the sexual revolution. Just before I was suspended from lecturing at the university, I also explained to my students the danger of gender mainstreaming that's currently raging in Europe. I summarized the delusional thinking of Judith Butler's gender trouble. I summarized her teaching, which consistently leads to the acceptance of every perversion, including the removal of the taboo of incest and also intergenerational sex. A few, a few roundly indoctrinated students came to the rescue of gender studies and said that they didn't go that far. Well, they're quite right. They don't go that far. But they refrain from going that far out of shame. It is only because they are not complete perverts that they retain a moral sense that allows them to stand back from the final consequences of Butler's theory. And what they don't understand is that eventually one shall not escape the consequences of the premises he chose to tolerate in the first place. There's a nice Latin saying that, that goes that way. Patiendo multa venient quineque aspati. Toleration will bring about what you are not willing to tolerate. Consider this now. When they refuse the conclusions of their very own premises, they sure show they retain a sense of shame. But they have banished rational thinking. For what is more irrational and mistaken than assuming a premise and rejecting the consequence flowing from it? Judith Butler has one strong point. She is quite logical and consistent. She assumes a premise and she sticks to its conclusions. The premise, to be sure, is delusional. But she maintains not a sense of shame, but a sense of rationality, insofar as she does not try to escape from even the most repulsive consequences of her assumptions. And this is possible only because she is obviously deeply troubled, and trouble here amounts to total lack of shame. Most people aren't that disturbed, 
But most people don't want to see the whole picture either. And that is why we have a responsibility here. We have to show the sexual revolution for what it is. If we show the big picture, the logic of it, what premises imply and what's the logical outcome of the assumptions, people may still recoil in horror. And Professor Plinio Correa de Oliveira has very insightful words about why it is necessary to reveal and unmask what's really going on so that we can help arouse a reaction from the otherwise manipulated people. Allow me to quote from his book, Revolution and Counter-Revolution. Well, I'm sure you know it all already, but it's worth quoting. You now, Plato says that the nice things you should, should come again and again, twice and thrice, so... He says, It is not sufficient to point out the risk that our civilization may disappear altogether. We must know how to reveal amid the chaos that envelops us the whole face of the revolution in its immense hideousness. Whenever this face is revealed, outbursts of vigorous reaction appear. Thus, the counter-revolution must frequently unmask the whole face of the revolution in order to exorcise the spell it casts upon its victims." End quote. As you expose the facts, you help people understand that the slogans they have been accustomed to hear are nothing but taglines used by the powers that be to manipulate them so as not to arouse suspicion about what's really at stake. Take one example, just one. My body, my right. Heard it all the time. What a catchphrase, really. And yet devoid of any sound meaning when you allow its content to sink in for just a moment. What are you talking about, my body? <laughs> when the child in your body is evidently not to be equated with your body, who does ask a pregnant woman how things are going with a body? <laughs> Everyone willing to ask about the unborn child will ask about him or her as a real being distinct from the body wherein he or she is located. Then again, what about the DNA? Check the DNA. Your body has its very own DNA. And it's your body indeed when it shares your DNA. Now what about the unborn in the mother's womb? It's not her body, just check the DNA. If you want science to double check what's obvious to anyone who retains a pinch of common sense. My body, my right. Even though, even though this were to be conceded, I'm pleased the baby agrees with me. <laughs> even though the my body, my right would be conceded, it would still be off topic. Since the baby is not, the unborn baby is not your body, it's in your body, but it's definitely not your body. It's about geography, outside, inside. It's not about what it is, it's about where it is, or better, where he or she is. As you convince people to pause for just a while and take a look, take a closer look at the catchphrases they are being trained to repeat, you must make it possible for them to notice that those taglines are not unlike the slogans from the famous novel 1984, self-contradictory and meaningless. You know, war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. People hate it. People hate it when they understand that they have been manipulated. Show them they were. Many believe that we, the religious people, are dogmatic morons, when actually we are the only ones who really dare to think, for we know perfectly well that it is truth, and even more, and even more truth with capital T, that sets us free. Again, expose the facts and shed some light into what's really going on. People aren't shown the whole picture. Hence, they tend to accept 
one small change after the other. They would object if everything was shattered overnight, but they certainly will not make a move for what appears to be a matter of detail, a lesser evil, or a rather innocuous keeping up with the times. Well, it's a well-known process, very efficient with all that. The revolution uses this piecemeal strategy, known as the boiling frog, or the salami slice strategy, and applies it widely to isolate opponents and score points. We may very well appear to be easily triggered, but it's crucial that we allow for people to notice that they are being callously pushed towards a very slippery slope. And it's better to start worrying before it is too late. A slippery slope it is. For one thing usually leads to another. And when people, just like my former students, say they themselves will not go that far, it is useful to show them that they are eventually brought that far before they even realize what's going on. You never, you never escape the consequences of the premises you adopt. The whole revolutionary process is nowhere more apparent than in what has to do with identity and henceforth with sex and gender. Everything here is deeply interwoven so that the many branches of the sexual revolution are set to stand or crumble together. What does this mean? Simply put, we cannot be focusing on just one part of the whole issue of sexual misbehavior. If we do not resist on all fronts, it is inevitable that we will be overrun. Well, we're quite fortunate that Claire Chrétien is here. Uh, from the excellent LifeSite News. In June last year, she published a very insightful paper. The title is, I'm pro-life, and that means I'm against contra contraception and gay marriage. Check it on LifeSite News, it's from the 2nd of June. The idea, and it's very, very true, the idea at the core of the short paper is the famous simile of the seamless garment, the different parts of which are so deeply interwoven with each other that what you are facing is really one and the same thing. You can certainly pick your target, but it would be a fatal mistake if you ever thought that you could, for example, tackle the evil of abortion on its own. And that is because the particular evil of abortion doesn't stand and fall on its own. It is part of an evil network, the parts of which are interdependent and reinforcing each other. You can certainly weaken pro-abortion policies. Yet, the evil shall keep ways to recover from the wounds unless you tackle its network as a whole which means that you have to identify what other parts of the network you should tackle together with abortion. And Miss Chrétien, who really bears a predestined name, since Chrétien is Christian in French, she rightly identifies other evils to be tackled together with abortion as homosexual so-called marriage and contraception. It is revealing that Lord Cardinal Iniguez, which I quoted earlier, revealed just the same intuition a few days ago when he reminded us that people who engage in homosexual intercourse, who contracept or who practice adultery, even though civil society calls it a second marriage, those people cannot receive communion. It was right to link all those evils together. We all know that the mythical Greco-Roman hero, Hercules, in one of his labors, he had to face and defeat the Hydra, a serpentine monster with multiple heads. When the hero cut off one of the heads, two new heads grew from the body. Hercules, 
eventually defeated the creature by scorching the neck stumps so that he could at least kill the beast once and for all by hacking down all of its heads and burning all the stumps. The monster of sexual revolution is also some kind of hydra and shall not be put to death if only part of the problem is dealt with. According to the Greek poet Hesiod, the mythological hydra was the unholy offspring of the serpent god Typhus and its hybrid mate Echidna. Our present-day Hydra is also the offspring of two monsters, namely the French Revolution and Marxism. Both wage a total war against God and the order of creation so as to establish the model of a new man owing everything to himself and the inevitable outcome of their mating is the sexual revolution. The Marquis de Sade advocated the overthrow of sexual morality and the disciples of Karl Marx held that sexual repression was both the produce and the very cement of the bourgeois society they wanted to destroy. It then comes as no surprise to see the early Bolshevik revolutionaries in Russia implementing laws in favor of divorce and liberalizing sexual misconduct as soon as they reached power. They knew perfectly well that the utter destruction of civilization as the West knew it could only be achieved by the elimination of religion and faith in God. Then again, they understood that religion was by itself too strong a food to deal with. And so they attacked the very pillar of religion, which is the natural family, father, mother, and children united, the cradle of faith transmitted from one generation to another. And they knew from the French revolutionaries that no stronger disruption could be brought about than the one that is achieved through sexual revolution and the undermining of sexual restraint. After the Bolshevik pioneers, a more pragmatic approach prevailed in the Soviet Union. Uh, Stalin understood very well that it would lead to the downfall of the socialist state itself, so the change in policies within the Soviet Union. But Stalin and his minions directed the subversive power of the revolution outside of Russia, and it came to be that what happened was precisely what had been predicted by Our Lady at Fatima, Russia spreading its errors all over the world. Wilhelm Reich, the socialist psychoanalyst who mixed the legacies of Sigmund Freud and Karl Marx and settled in the United States was disappointed to see the Russians move back from their initial disruptive and destructuring laws, but he had great hopes for America. Reich didn't live to see the full bloom of the sexual revolution of the 1960s, but we still eat today the bitter fruits as they are keep blooming just like the heads of the hydra. Those fruit are now the, are now the widespread idea that one's freedom depends on his being allowed to give a free rein to his sex drives. This is perversive mentality. For example, and writing about economy and politics, uh, John Horvath II here from TFP, America, writes that, I quote, it's in his book, Return to Order. In the vanguard, a frenetical intemperance witnessed in the Western economies, we always find a relentless drive to throw off restraint and seek gratification, which, like a bulldozer, runs over any neighborhood, custom, or cultural value that stands in its way." End quote. Free in the moral revolutionary context, this means free from the natural consequences of sexual expression, which are deemed to represent a most unfortunate burden. You shall be free if you are free to meet with a same-sex partner and yet it's escape the deadly backlash nature itself delivers to those who sin against natural order. You shall be free if you are free to have sex without running the risk of having a baby and if, if you are unfortunate enough to breed, then you shall be free to kill the unborn under the false pretense that it is but 
a clamp of cells. All of these sexual misbehavior are patently wrong in themselves. And it's not my point here because I'm running out of time and I know it. It's not, I'm sorry, there's a problem with philosophers. When they begin to speak, they never stop. <laughs> but I've, I have a reminder here, so just a few more minutes, please. All of these sexual misbehaviors are patently wrong in themselves. Just to state a few obvious points. Same-sex intercourse runs counter the complementarity of male and female and negates the very meaning of sexual expression and openness to life. Contraception, too, opposes life and reduces the sex partner to a means of pleasuring the self without facing the consequences. And as for the clump of cells, it is so well designed that it is no more a clump than the bigger clumps we call adult human beings. What do we think of someone who eats and then vomits what he has eaten? We say that he is either suffering from an eating disorder, which is a very unpleasant condition indeed, or that he is a pervert who eats for the sake of eating while cheating nature as he refuses to face the overweight that comes as a consequence of eating without restraint. People are quite smart and clever when they label the whole eat and vomit process as a disease or a perversion. Why is it then that the very same people cease to be smart and clever when quite a similar process happens in a different realm. You want sex, but you want to escape the consequences of sex. And that's not right. Just as it is not right to eat for the sake of pleasure and then vomit because of your refusal to acknowledge that pleasure isn't the one and only component of eating. Pleasure is a side effect. We gladly accept as we pursue the right end. But when pleasure itself ceases to be an extra and becomes the end itself, we lose sight of what is right and engage in all kinds of misconduct and misbehavior. All this is both obvious and inescapable. So why is it that people don't see what's wrong in homosexuality, contraception, and destroying family bonds and the fruit of the womb? Why indeed, if not for the pervasive numbness that is the fruit from quite another matrix, that is, the fruit from the sexual revolution blinding and binding us with the ties of comfort and pleasure freed from its natural consequences. The beta fruits, the beta fruits of sexual revolution are an aversion to God and to nature. Every sexual misconduct, be it promiscuity, homosexuality, contraception, abortion, etc. Every single evil here is deeply interlinked with all others and flows from one and the same state of mind, which is a revolt against the natural order and the will of the Creator. In the words of the psalmist, I quote, Why have the Gentiles raged and the people devised vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the princes met together against the Lord and against this Christ. The present rebellion has its closest roots in the French Revolution and is brought about by the various embodiments of Marxism, notably the infamous Frankfurt School. The epitome of rebellion against all that is natural lies obviously in the current tidal wave of gender mainstreaming, which goes as far as freeing man from his very male or female identity so that his unchecked and mostly sexual drives are neither curtailed nor limited by anything but pure willpower, aberrant and meaningless. As we fight, as we fight against sexual revolution in all its aspects, without downplaying any one of them, we are reminded to acknowledge them for what they, ha what they are. 
the many heads of the Hydra, the ungodly offspring of Karl Marx and the Marquis de Sade, plague and scourge of civilization. Its madness reaches its full potential in the gender ideology, where it is best seen as, it has, as what it is really. Allow me to quote from a brilliantly insightful analysis on the part of Bishop Schneider in an interview with Adelante La Fe just one year ago. Gender ideology, he said, is really a kind of obvious perversion of a conception of reality that is rebellion against reality. It reveals itself as nothing else than an ultimate extreme form of Marxism, a rebellion against reality and fundamentally against God. The brave bishop said it all. The various embodiments and offspring of Marxism are still the scourge of civilization, even though Soviet Russia crumbled 30 years ago. We had been warned, like I said, and it is no surprise then if the errors spread by the Bolshevik revolutionaries keep plaguing the world. The Second Vatican Council wretchedly missed the opportunity to issue a solemn condemnation of the Marxist root of present-day revolutions and the consecration of Russia, as you know, the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary hasn't been carried out yet. The fight is thus far from over, but we have good reason to stay firm, as the triumph of Mary Immaculate is just a matter of time. And the Lord, we know it, the Lord is eternally victorious. The kingly prophet said it all in what comes next in the psalm I just quoted. The psalm says, He that dwelleth in heaven shall laugh at the kings of the earth. The Lord shall deride them. They shall, then shall he speak to them in his anger and trouble them in his rage. And now, O ye kings, understand, receive instruction, you that judge the earth. Serve ye the Lord with fear and rejoice unto him with trembling. Embrace discipline, lest at any time the Lord be angry and you perish from the just way, when his wrath shall be kindled in a short time. Blessed are all that trust in him. Well, I thank you for your patience at enduring my awful accent. Please, I, I want to conclude by asking for your prayers for, for me, for my wife, and last but not least, for our first child who is expected to be born in July this year. Thanks. I just wanted to say in, in public once again how um, grateful we in Brussels are and in Belgium are for the courage the professor had had uh, in the last year. Maybe it's no coincidence as it was the 100th birthday of the apparitions in Fatima. So we may, without canonizing him, uh, <laughs> now, uh, no, no, please pray for me, really. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.